How's this? Yeah. You can hear me okay? It's really great to see all of you. Uh, m my greatest joy is lecturing to a captive audience, so I'm just at my happiest right now. Uh, I uh, came up to uh, Anchorage and Fairbanks in 1978, and it was... Uh, I had a lot of protective factors going for me in terms of being protected against seasonal affective disorder or winter blues. Uh, I was young and I was really interested in uh, Fairbanks and my job and I had a lot of fun. Um, I also had a lot of social support and family support from family members and so there was a nice feeling of connectedness for me here. But I also had some risk factors for seasonal affective disorder. I um, worked um, as a dispatcher for the city and I worked really crazy hours on shift work. How many of you do shift work? Anybody here? Shift worker? Okay, so you understand. It really um, just wreaks havoc with your circadian rhythm and uh, th it's the circadian rhythms that are really uh, disturbed when you get the winter blues so that your eating gets off, your sleeping gets off of its rhythm. And so I would, um, I was sort of like a thrill-seeking uh, vampire. I'd get off at 8 a.m. and wait until the sun come up before I'd dash off to my basement apartment and hang upside down for eight hours. <laughs> so tonight, I've got to keep an eye on this mic. Uh, you probably left a warm house and um, dinner to be here, and I really appreciate it. Probably the person who's suffering from the winter blues is back at home. They might have sent you as an envoy to come back and bring information on how they could feel better. Usually when you've got seasonal affective disorder, you don't have enough energy to get out on your own. So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight is... Uh, Seasonal Affective Disorder, or SAD, it's also known as the Winter Blues. I'll tell you a little bit about what it actually is, um, how it's different from its worrisome counterpart, major depression, and uh, what causes SAD, some of the uh, factors that make you vulnerable to it, and um, then how we can manage it. Uh, how we can work with seasonal affective disorder, both kind of on a traditional way with uh, tried and true mechanisms like vitamin D or phototherapy, but also some ways that you can sort of reestablish your own individual rhythm and sort of get your life back in balance, which will also be a, a really nice effect for you. So who gets the winter blues? Uh, normal people are vulnerable to the winter blues because it's a biological kind of experience. Uh, it has a biological uh, cause to it. Um, in major depression, depressive disorders, there can be a family heritability to, to depression. There can be an environmental or psychological vulnerability to major depression. Uh, but uh, the winter blues is pretty much a biological phenomenon, so anybody uh, is vulnerable to it. It's uh, usually confined to people in the northern latitudes, so the farther north you go, the greater your risk is for developing it. So in Fairbanks, Barrow, here we are. Uh, Anchorage, actually, people are pretty vulnerable to it because they don't get as much sunshine as you do, um, as, as, as we all do up here. And then the fall and winter seasons uh, are uh, really the time that you're going to experience it the most. In fact, in April, you kind of have to be a little bit careful because you have so much more sunshine in April that you might, might still be feeling bad. Uh, you might still feel kind of blue, but your energy picks up. And so you're still feeling bad, but you actually have some energy. So it can get a little bit chaotic or a little bit um, uncomfortable uh, for people in April. Winter blues uh, are different from major depression in the sense that the blues, the, the seasonal affective disorder is a little more confined. Its uh, symptoms are a little bit more limited. Major depression is kind of complex. 
Seasonal affective disorder, you can expect the sad and blue mood that's really typical of depression, feeling down. Uh, there is a great attraction to food um, when you've got the winter blues. There's overeating, there's a real deep craving for carbohydrates and sugars, so cookies, mashed potatoes, uh, potato chips, bread, pastries, those kinds of things are uh, really appealing. Uh, and uh, to Typically people put on some pounds, um, it's sort of kind of like a hibernating mode. And uh, there's a sleep disturbance, it's kind of odd. You, you oversleep, um, you need more sleep in the winter time than you do in the summertime. So if you're an eight hour kind of person you might need nine or ten if you're experiencing the winter blues. But it's not the kind of quality sleep that makes you feel rested. You might um, have real light or interrupted sleep sleep and then when you uh, wake up in the morning you're still tired. So sleeping like between 7 and 9 a.m. is a really good time uh, for you to get some quality sleep. But even then, uh, you may uh, have a lot of dra daytime drowsiness where you're nodding off, your eyes are shutting, uh, there's a decreased interest, um, your sex drive goes down, your interest in activities, your gusto kind of um, decreases. Uh, more rare, uh, but, but still evident, is some anxiety, uh, poor concentration, you know, you have trouble focusing at work, holding a thought for very long. Um, if you're studying, it's harder to learn stuff and maintain it in your memory. And there's some social discomfort. It's hard to get interested in people. It's hard to listen to them, hard to talk to them. It takes a lot of energy. So you may find that people who have the winter blues, they have a lot of social avoidance. They'll kind of stick to themselves. And it's just uh, because it's hard to relate to people, it takes a lot of work. Major depression, in contrast, is a lot more complicated. Uh, you can have the same um, kinds of appetite disturbance, but you can um, lose interest in food and lose a lot of weight with um, major depression. You can also do some overeating, uh, but you can go either way. The same thing with sleep. People with major depression often suffer from insomnia, so with the winter blues, you might need a lot of sleep. Um, with major depression, you may not be able to get to sleep. You may wake up at 3, 4, 5 a.m. and not be able to go back to sleep. And then um, your sleep can be disturbed by nightmares and uh, just kind of a, a light sleeping. If we look at the comparison between the two disorders, then you've got down mood, uh, appetite disturbances, sleep problems, the same fatigue, whereas you have daytime drowsiness with SAD, um, with depression you'll find people move very slowly. It, they have what we call psychomotor retardation. Um, they speak slowly, they move slowly, they do things real slowly. Um, on the other end of the spectrum with major depression you can have that retardation but you can also have have agitation, where people they can't they can't sit down for long, so they get up and they move around. They're kind of uncomfortable. Uh, there's little pleasure uh, and diminished interest in major depression. Um, poor concentration, indecision. It's really hard to to make up your mind about something. Uh, uh, hard to focus. Uh, it, as the depression deepens in major depression, you won't see this so much with SAD. Um, there's a sense of your confidence and your self-esteem being impaired and lowered some. You start to doubt yourself, um, not sure you're up for things. Um, you may feel guilty about things that ordinarily um, uh, don't really merit feeling guilty or ashamed about. Um, in, as, as you get even more down, you might start to feel hopeless that you're going to feel better. Uh, things may not um, look very rosy for the future. And, and, and that's when um, 
your 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 thinking kind of slips a little. Um, or a person's thinking gets um, a little bit unreal at this level of depression when you start to feel hopeless. Um, sometimes people start thinking about death or dying. Um, suicide may come into the picture, suicide kind of thinking. And, and a person may begin to believe that their loved ones might be better off without them. And that's where that unreal piece comes from, uh, comes into play, a, a thinking that people might be better off without you. Uh, so if some of you have experienced major depression um, and had that sense, or you have it now, that people might be better off with you gone, um, hear me when I tell you that that's not the case, that the world is better with you in it than uh, you out of it. Uh, I want to show you a little clip from Enchanted April. How, how many of you know the movie Enchanted April? My cousin just told me tonight that it's on um, Turner um, uh, Movie uh, Network. What's that? It's in Italy. That's right. That's right. Um, four women uh, who live in England, it's post-war England, um, they are, have uh, had a horrible winter. It's rainy and cold and dark. And so they're um, half out of their minds with um, the winter blues. And they agree to rent a villa, all four of them. They're strangers and they meet and agree to rent this villa on the um, coast of uh, Amalfi Coast of Italy. And when um, I bring up the, the movie, uh, you'll see that uh, the characters are very brittle. Uh, there's a lot of irritability and agitation. They're uncomfortable. They're unhappy. There's sort of a rigidity in their thinking. Uh, they're kind of hunkered down. So they've just arrived at the villa. They've been there about 24 hours. And, but you all, if you watch Lottie um, carefully, you'll see her opening and kind of melting and thawing. And as she warms up and the sun impacts her, you can see her opening up. Um, interest, kindness, um, just sort of a lot of movement inside of her. It's really lovely to watch. The notable thing about Enchanted April is the qualitative shift in Lottie's experience it's a slow kind of immersion into the winter blues where you don't really realize that the quality of your life is starting to unravel a little bit. And uh, that feeling good physically, um, it, mentally, it sort of becomes uh, um, something that you can't remember anymore as a felt experience. And so tonight, what I want to do is um, help you understand the causes of SAD, but more than that, understand what you can do to sort of reestablish that really nice feeling of just being alive and taking pleasure in that. SAD is, uh, as we understand it, uh, sunlight on the face it activates the release of hormones and neurotransmitters in the brain that are really uh, helpful and responsible in mood regulation. Uh, it's uh, really helpful in uh, energy, um, in the body, uh, feeling energized, interested, engaged, feeling healthy and well. And when sunlight doesn't stimulate your forehead and get into your eyes, you don't produce vitamin D3. Uh, and you also experience uh, a disruption in your circadian rhythms, which are the biological rhythms that regulate uh, physical activities like uh, appetite, uh, energy level, sleep cycles. And when your sleep cycles get disrupted, then it's very hard to function during the day.
About 6% of Americans, about 6 out of 100 Americans experience seasonal defect, uh, affective disorder. But I, I don't think that that's 6% six, six across the country. I think a large number of people are usually, uh, uh, there's a concentration of those 6% the farther north you go. So there's going to be more than 6% of people in Fairbanks who are experiencing si seasonal affective disorder. Fewer people down in Phoenix. It tends to be people in their 30s. If you're in your 20s or in your teens, you're not going to be as impacted as people in their 30s. Uh, as you age, you become vulnerable to depression. And so sometimes what can happen is the winter blues might get a hold of somebody in their 30s, and then as they go into their 40s and 50s, they may become vulnerable to the major depression. So it's, it's uh, uh, not unheard of for young people, but more in your 30s. Research shows women tend to be more vulnerable than men. Sometimes more than half of women, the numbers can go up to almost um, 80 or 90 percent of um, seasonal affective disorder sufferers being women uh, tends to be uh, uh, people who also might be at risk who have a history of trauma or who have a family um, history of depression if you have a parent who um, or a sibling who suffers from a depressive disorder, you're about one and a half to three times as likely to um, experience a major depression or winter blues yourself. So treatments for SAD, I've, I've sort of categorized them in two different ways. The first set is uh, research proven kinds of treatments that are effective for people. How many of you tried light therapy already? Yeah, good, good. It's very popular. About half the people who experience seasonal affective disorder get relief um, from phototherapy. Um, they say, um, experts say that if you tailor the phototherapy to your own sleep wake, wake cycles, your chances increase to 80% of you having a remission of your winter blues with phototherapy. They recommend about 10,000 lux, uh, LUX of light. That's a really intensely bright light. For those of you who've seen those sad lights, they're really just very intense and they hit your forehead and your eyes. Light visor therapy that just hits your eyes doesn't seem to be as effective as a light that hit, hits your full face. Negative ion therapy, interestingly enough, was sort of discovered by accident. It has, um, uh, they were using negative ion therapy for control groups in their studies on phototherapy and they discovered by accident that it actually works. All you have to do is train the ionizer on your bed um, about a half hour before or half after half hour after you wake um, at a full force, full intensity for uh, a few days in a row and you'll have a remission of your symptoms at about the same um, level as the light therapy. What they're both hypothesized to do is to increase vitamin D metaboli uh, metabolism and also to restore your circadian rhythms back to their normal pattern. Vitamin D uh, is uh, supposed to be directly linked to the neurotransmitter serotonin. If anybody has an interest in neurotransmitters, those are sort of like the happy chemicals in the brain. Dopamine uh, is also one of those neurotransmitters. And serotonin regulates appetite, energy, and sleep. And uh, the D vitamin D3 is uh, thought uh, or hypothesized to have an effect on uh, the serotonin levels. Uh, vitamin D3 then is probably your most efficient and cheapest way. Instead of buying a sad light or an ionizer, you can just take a, a vitamin D uh, supplement and that should just perk you right up. There's sort of a folk information out there about what um, number of IUs is effective, around 1,200. But if you really want to be uh, proactive about it, what you can do is you can go to a lab, get a doctor to order labs for you and have your vitamin D levels measured. And then you can go back to your doc and get a good regimen for increasing your dosage if that's what you need to do. 
Medication, really great. We usually rely on antidepressant medications to treat the winter blues, but there is a new medication out now that's very promising. It's had some good effectiveness in trials. It's called Valdoxin, and it uh, unlike the other antidepressants, it works directly on your circadian rhythms and the serotonin, uh, well not so much serotonin, but your circadian and your vitamin D production. Uh, so that's uh, been really promising. Uh, about 25 milligrams, uh, they say that the side effects are pretty limited. Not, not too bad. Uh, other medications that have been um, helpful in research is Wellbutrin, XL, Prozac. There's um, a medication that's really handy in controlling eating disorders like bulimia and anorexia called d It's also really good um, with um, regulating um, anxiety and irritability, decreasing those. And that's been really good with winter blues too. Psychotherapy, my personal favorite. The good thing about psychotherapy is it has about the same effect, maybe a little better than the phototherapy, but it works on a different mechanism, which is kind of your self-talk. The research that's been done is with cognitive behavior therapy, which helps correct what we think of as errors in thinking, um, sort of like problems in how you make attributions, um, like in negative ways it helps you make attributions contributions in more helpful, pleasant ways. And the good thing about psychotherapy is that it gives you skills for dealing with those down effects of depression and winter blues long after phototherapy has ceased to be effective. With phototherapy, the minute you stop using it with the ionizer, the minute you stop using it, it goes away. But you can learn skills with cognitive behavior therapy and psychotherapy for managing managing the self-talk that can stay with you for years after you've uh, gone through the treatment. The most effective thing that you can do when treating your winter blues is to take a multi-pronged approach. So you can take, uh, you can do some cognitive behavior therapy and some light therapy, and the two together have a greater impact than the two separately. So you get a really nice effect from that. Uh, we've seen medication and psychotherapy do the same thing. The most effective treatment for moderate depression is a combination of medication and psychotherapy. You can also um, combine vitamin D and light therapy. The idea is to do more than one thing. That sums up what we think of as traditional kinds of treatments. Now we think about what can you do on your own. And, and, in, this, and in this section, you can... Uh, what I like to think about is sort of like restoring a balance or a rhythm to your life that you lose when you experience seasonal affective disorder. And um, it makes me wonder um, what kind of horses we have in the audience. I think of like two different kinds of horses and in our society, in our culture, sometimes we get confused about uh, uh, what what uh, kind of horses we've got on our hands. Somebody goes out to buy a horse and are they looking for a horse that's going to be a pack horse, that's going to do a nice long endurance trip, kind of take it all, uh, the evening off and relax and take it easy and then the next day a nice consistent um, uh, uh, trip along a trail. They're usually strong animals. They can move slowly but they're sure-footed. And that's very different from a racehorse um, who does have a really tight race, um, uh, very intense action, and then the rest of the time um, sort of preparing for the race and resting. And sometimes I think we start working for bosses who don't know what kind of horses we are. And so they try to make us do both. They try to make us do the long, hard, nine to five days work and they also want us to be the sprinters, the big project, intense work that gets the project pushed through really fast, really innovative, kind of bright, fast thinking. And the problem is, is we're getting into a society where people expect us to be both kinds of horses. And maybe where we even get confused about 
what kind of horse we are. And so what you may find yourself doing is working 12 hour days or 15 hour days or working weekends when you should be like having your downtime. So it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a thinking that more is better and it's not better and we lose contact with what really gives us pleasure. Sometimes being in love with your job is just forgetting what else there is there for you. And people get a lot of support for being really good at their jobs, for doing things and producing really high quality work, producing well, and it can have sort of an addictive quality to it. Depression isn't for babies. When you get into a cycle where you're worn out and broken down, it's hard to really pull yourself out of that sort of numb place that you're in. Um, if any of you suffer from chronic pain, you know how much courage it takes to change your lifestyle and try something new and have faith that this, this change, doing this thing differently is going to be good for me. And, and so as you, as you think about changing your lifestyle and things you can do to uh, get balance and rhythm in your life, know that you're probably going to be up against some inertia. That the depression, um, either the people um, that you love that have seasonal affective disorder or you are going to encounter some resistance. And it's like that first step, the one where you really try to get out and walk for five minutes outside or go, or go for a ski, um, that's going to be the hardest one. And once you get a little momentum going, then it gets easier and then it's, you start to feel better and then it starts taking on its own momentum. But initially, to get through the day, to handle one responsibility after another requires enormous courage. Feeling not so good. This is where people are when they have the winter blues. They're stressed out. Um, responsibilities frazzle them. Uh, they don't have a lot in reserve to deal with chaos or trouble. Uh, they're nervous. Um, they lose their tempers easily. They bark. Uh, feeling unwell physically. Uh, you can um, just sort of wake up in the morning have kind of a grossed out feeling in your stomach or your head's kind of dizzy and it's, uh, you know, you feel a little um, uh, disoriented. Um, physical pain. Um, winter blues can give you a headache, uh, neck ache, back ache, even your feet can hurt. Um, it's uh, uh, joints, muscles can hurt. Feeling good. This is where you're going um, or your loved one is going. Um, really enjoying a social activity like going to a party and really having a nice conversation that's interesting. Um, people, they make you curious. You know, you, you want to get to know them because they're, they're interesting to you. There's an enthusiasm um, and an, a real engagement. Um, you, you get inspired. You get innovative ideas. Things that interest you, you kind of associate to new ideas and you kind of open up and, and and get inspired. Uh, there's an alertness to you. You can watch and you can pay attention and you can focus. It's really a high <laughs> and, it, and it does increase your self-confidence. Uh, it, it makes you feel like you're capable of doing something and, and that's kind of um, what happens in the summertime is once you get that nice blast of light, you can get a little expansive and think, gee, I, uh, there's a lot I can do. I can really handle this. I really like this quote by uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, the rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form of its innate violence. And, and that's what I think of as the sort of predicament that we've gotten ourselves into in dominant culture is a focus on productivity and really not understanding how much we have to gain by just goofing off and lolling around, puttering, doing nothing. And, and if you've 
you've tried it, sometimes what you might notice uh, is that it feels kind of weird to putter or do nothing. You might feel vaguely guilty, like you should be working or you should be studying or you should be doing something else more responsible than this. Um, some people, um, um, uh, we've had clients in the clinic and in my private practice who tell me how guilty they feel for taking a nap. And I think part of that is that they're caught up in this pattern of productivity and focus on that. Sigmund Freud said you must be able to love, work, and to play. That dreams, fantasies, they produce some of your richest material in terms of your quality of life and in terms of your innovative ideas and thinking. And this is probably a time in our country's history and in the world when innovative thinking is really precious to us. Recreation and exercise, uh, there's uh, a significant body of research showing exercise to be really an important uh, uh, antidepressant. Um, that when you exercise, natural endorphins are released in your brain that have a very pleasurable kind of feeling to them. Uh, some research also that um, exercise has a healing impact on the brain, a rejuvenating and healing impact on the brain, and may even heal. Um, some trauma. So, uh, and recreation, uh, play. You know, just outside playing and fooling around is really good. Rest. Doing nothing is as important as being productive. That uh, your associations in your brain, the way they kind of flow, sometimes you can solve a problem just by kind of letting yourself go down into sort of an alpha state of rest in your brain. Being with friends, having social contact. This is really a tough one for people because, you know, if, if you're around people who are irritable, you, you can kind of get um, kind of pulled back and held in a little bit. Um, sometimes you have friends who are really going through a, a hard time and they're really struggling and, and you need to be there for them. You need to help them and take care of them. And that's really a good thing for you to do. But the friends that I'm talking about here for help your um, winter blues are friends that make you happy, that feel good, that don't stress you out, where you kind of liven up and laugh when you're with them. Those are the friends that are going to be really helpful and really good for you right now. Um, talking to someone. Talking helps us to become aware of what we're thinking and feeling. There's something in the process of speaking and um, and using language that helps to bring thoughts and feelings up into our consciousness. If we can put words to how we're feeling and how we're thinking, then we don't act out. We don't get impulsive and we don't do things that we might regret later. So being able to talk to someone helps you understand where you're at and what's going on for you in ways you may not have been taught or understand, um, uh, previously understood how to do. Talking to people also gives them permission to talk to you. When you talk to friends and family in a real genuine way um, that's comfortable for you, you allow them to open up to you too. You sort of set a norm for that. So everybody's going to be different. But being aware of how you're feeling and how you're thinking helps you to know what makes you feel good, what makes you happy. And that's really what it's all about. Because if you're feeling good, if you're happy, everything changes. It becomes easier to solve problems. It becomes easier to get along with people. We're um, very attachment-oriented kinds of beings. Social isolation is a, a response to not feeling well. When we're at our best and when we're feeling good, we really want to be with people and we really need to be with people. There's a lot that happens in conversations and in connecting with people that's really good for us. If you do find that the carbohydrate craving is really amazingly strong for you, 
think protein instead. Um, if you're wanting cake, try nuts. Um, if you're vegetarian, you might try a high protein grain like a high protein wheat or quinoa. A protein gives you more of a sustaining kind of long-term energy. And it's probably what your body is really needing rather than carbohydrates, which give you a burst of energy, but also can let you down quickly. A potato is not going to do that as much as um, a jelly donut. But uh, you'll still have that rise and fall with a carbohydrate or a sugar. A protein will give you a lot more um, oomph. One of, um, I, I remember in 78 when I came to Fairbanks, it was, a, um, it's, it's lovely now and it was lovely then, but um, I had come from California and uh, I was really struck uh, by Fairbanks' um, mysterious um, intensity of the seasons. Um, beautiful light, beautiful darkness, beautiful sunsets. It had a mystical, mysterious quality to me. It was nothing like uh, watching the snowfall here. And um, it inspired me and um, nourished me for years. And um, it, it still has that for me. And it's, this is such a special place. And it's got um, lots of art organizations, Fairbanks Drama Association, FLOT. Um, there's um, the Arts Association. There's so much to do. There's um, skiing and recreation. And so if you check into the news miners, um, is it Latitude 65? Is that what it is? It gives you a listing of activities. You might find a book club or um, sewing, some uh, hobbies and interests. Uh, do something that'll kind of get you out and moving a little bit. Those are ways that you can help get yourself alive and moving again. Um, I didn't want my, I didn't want to forget Scrooge tonight. Um, there is a, f have, has it, have any of you seen the film um, Scrooge with Bill Murray in it? Yeah, it's really a great movie. And um, it's, the, it's Bill Murray's modern day version of Scrooge. And um, in this clip I want to show you, uh, it, uh, Bill Murray is, is the Scrooge. And he's gone um, and he's had visits from the ghost of Christmas past, present and future and seen his death. And um, after a miserable life of being a mean, selfish, self-centered man, manipulative, he's completely transformed, um, just like the Scrooge is in A Christmas Tale. And um, in this cut from the movie, um, he goes back to the television station that he's the vice president or president of, and he's gotten himself a, a, a camera, and he's telling um, the viewers um, to, to change. It's it's a wonderful piece, and. Uh, it's interesting, it, it, it takes place on Christmas Eve and he's got everybody working on Christmas Eve. And so that's really reflective of, of who he was. And now we get to see who he's become. So here is the, well I think of 10 pathways from depression, uh, a summation, a summary of things that you can do that may be part of that multi-pronged approach to um, a system of taking care of yourself, of getting balance in your life, and rediscovering play and connection with others. And thank you for being so patient and getting through that. <laughs> <laughs>